Okay, welcome to chapter 13. Um, again, this is for um, CJC 111, Introduction to Criminal Justice at Wake Tech. Um, this is being recorded in the summer of 2022, so I'll be trying to integrate some events that are happening now. Um, you'll excuse me if you're listening to this later and they seem very dated or you don't are aware of them. Um, the text we're using again is Criminal Justice in Action. We are updating it to the 11th edition now. The authors are Larry Gaines and Roger Lemoy, Leroy Miller. Uh, the publisher is Cengage. So, uh, we're going to talk about prisons and jails today. Uh, first quick thing, um, and I'm going to hit this again when we go uh, through the slides, but like a lot of vocabulary from the criminal justice um, field, uh, prison and jails is used by the general public, but not as precise as it probably should be. Technically, a prison only is run by a state, like the state of North Carolina or the state of Virginia, and a jail is typically only run by a county, such as here in Raleigh, the county of Wake, or if you're in uh, Binghamton, New York, Broome County, or if you're in... Uh, uh, Gosh, uh, if you're in New York City, uh, there's different counties inside New York City as well. So um, prisons are run by the states, jails are run by the counties. All right, let's advance a little bit. Um, I always like to include these um, questions. Uh, and I think it's important to go into each one of these chapters with an open mind asking ourselves what preconceptions are we coming in with, uh, what mistakes might we be making because of these preconceptions, how can we expand our thinking, open our horizons, and maybe understand the problem better and hopefully find solutions. So the first one there is think about the popular image of prison. Now most of you listening to this have never gone to prison or jail, so you don't have anything except typically the portrayals um, that we see in fiction. Uh, if we go to some of the older movies like uh, Shawshank Redemption, which is really a, a snapshot of prison life uh, from about the 1950s uh, through about the 1980s, it kind of looks like. Or even more modern TV programs, although this one uh, is increasingly not as modern because it's, I guess it's completed its run. Orange is a New Black, which focuses on uh, women's prison. Uh, but if you think about movies like that, whatever movie you can think of where they're De depicting prison, that is often your idea of prison. Now you may know intuitively that, well that's really not what prison is like, but what else do you have? Second question, are prisons worth the cost? Um, prisons are very expensive. We, we, we looked at some numbers uh, last uh, chapter. Uh, for example, here in North Carolina the average cost uh, per prisoner is about $37,000 a year. And if you think about that, that is a college education. So every person you put in prison, and there's uh, about 160,000 people under the corrections umbrella in North Carolina, uh, maybe about 80,000 or so of them are in prison. That's 80,000 people that could go to a well, private school at $37,000, maybe not Duke University or Harvard, but certainly a good private school. Um, what alternatives are there? Uh, you know, one of the things we've done in the West, if we said corporal punishment, the infliction of physical pain, is wrong, um, but I would argue that we've embraced a psychological punishment by incarcerating people in small jail cells for decades. Um, it's still punishment, um, and perhaps uh, you could say it's more cruel than the physical punishment. Are there any other alternatives? I mean, is there some sort of psychological punishment? I, I don't know. I think this is where you kind of think outside the box. Do prisons prevent or create more crime? We'd like to believe that prisons are one of those things, one of the bulwarks in our society, that really prevents uh, future crime. But is this true? Uh, could instead prisons, and sometimes they're described as such, as breeding grounds for crime? Certainly, they play a large role in the creation of gangs. Uh, what can we learn from other countries? Other countries have experimented with prisons. In, in fact, the modern American prison system can be said to really have begun in Belgium. Um, the first real prison uh, comes into existence in Europe 
uh, and then the Walnut Street Jail in America and others um, a little bit later. What can these other countries teach us? Well, of course, what could we teach them as well is a decent question. Here again are your learning objectives, which you have to uh, contrast, explain, describe. These are all goals I'm hoping that we can accomplish together as we go through this, but you don't have to focus on them uh, directly. Okay, so a little bit about the, the history of prisons. Um, of course, the, um, the, the, the prison system in the United States is in many sense a descendant of the English criminal justice system. So, you know, if you go back and you looked at the first English prisons, um, the first English prisons, interestingly enough, they had a, a kind, of, kind of a strange nickname. Um, they were known as Bridewells. And that's something that's clearly fallen out of the English language, but a Bridewell is actually a Bridewell Palace, which was a type of punishment. Uh, it, Bridewell Palace had little to do with direct punishment, it wasn't a jail, but that's what they were called. Early American prisons were very similar to those in England that we see. Now that's different than today, so one of the things that was pretty common is if you went to prison in early America, you often had to pay for many of the services you got in the prison. Did you get clothing? Did you get food? Did you get access to uh, medical treatment? Well, you had to pay for it. Um, prisons, prisoners were held for debt. Really, in, until the 19th century, and one could argue again today, um, we threw people in jail if they couldn't pay their debts. Um, the gender segregation that we see in American prisons today, in which we have male prisons and female prisons, uh, they didn't do that. Very often they, they put families even together. Some people weren't necessarily serving a sentence, but they were living in jail together. So men, women, children, all housed together. And they weren't necessarily separate cells. They had very large, often communal cells. This is the first real prison um, that existed. existed. Now this, was, uh, this is a postcard, obviously, and it's a picture of the Walnut Street Prison in 1774. Um, and Walnut Street Jail is it's also a common name for it. So um, this really comes about, the Walnut Street Jail, um, very much tied up in the history of the settlement of the state of Pennsylvania. And what you're going to find when you study prisons is that very often they have very strong geographical roots. So we'll talk about prison systems often with a preface like the Pennsylvania system or the Auburn system, which is a, a, a city in New York. So the Walnut Street Jail is our first one. This is set up as both a jail and a prison, so they didn't really make that distinction just yet in the late 1700s. And this is, like I said, at a root in Pennsylvania. Now Pennsylvania, named after William Penn, uh, was settled primarily by Quakers. And one of the things that Quakers believed is they did not believe in corporal punishment. Uh, you know, it's very common to brand and flog and beat prisoners, but the Quakers didn't believe that. You know, they have a very strong of uh, strong level of pacifism. Um, they did believe in the redemption of one's soul and one's life through work and prayer. So the first thing that would be different about these prisons is you were totally isolated. Um, you were isolated from one another. You were constantly kept busy with just very menial chores. Um, this was really an expensive way to operate. If you think about it, you're, you're going from these large communal cells uh, to solitary uh, cells. So the it, it wasn't really seen as a big success. Um, by the 1800s, um, it was very difficult actually to find work for them to do inside the prison so they often became idle and this this initial attempt kind of collapses but arising out of this is the Pennsylvania system now when the Walnut Street Jail fails they open up a um, a prison uh, called in Cherry Hill it's near Philadelphia and there is a uh, it's the Eastern Penitentiary system and then there was a western penitentiary system near Pittsburgh. If you look at a map of Pennsylvania, the east is Philadelphia, the west is Pennsylvania. So they, they took some of this in. They, they kept using it. Um, the, the Pennsylvania system is this first system. 
So this is the Eastern Pennsylvania. Like I said, there was also a Western system. And the Eastern Pennsylvania system um, really believed, of course, in the idea of separate confinement, so it kept that. Um, and this begins to resemble very much, if you look at that, you see it's got a kind of star shaped. Each one of those long buildings would house a separate cell. It begins to look a lot like we think prisons look like today. So it developed out of the Walnut Street prison. It applied in the Eastern and the Western penitentiary. We have silence again, near constant solitary confinement. We still do our work on our cells. Uh, and the only human contact you get is with visiting clergy. Now, um, if they were designed to transform individuals, they didn't do a great job. And other states, and you got to remember the states were in many ways in the 17, late 1700s, early 1800s, much more powerful entities than the federal government. So really the states, and this was an intention of federalism, are a laboratory within which we experiment. So some states like New York, which had a large population, looked at the Pennsylvania system and said, you're trying to fix people. We don't want to fix people. We want to make them more obedient. So we have um, a man here. This is Eliam Lenz. And he began to put the inmates together. Now, we're still going to have some silence, still going to have some segregation. We also begin to see the classic um, uniforms, the black and white stripes, you know, I guess the hangover for that in our society, if we think about it, is maybe, I'm trying to think of a figure, oh, uh, the, um, the McBurglar in McDonald's commercials, okay? So this is the New York system. Again, geographically, we've gone from Pennsylvania Walnut Street Jail to the whole Pennsylvania system based on those Eastern and Western to now the New York system. Still pretty similar, but much more interested in obedience than fixing people. So there is their Auburn system, and you'll notice the Auburn system is pretty similar uh, structurally uh, to what it looks like uh, in, in the Pennsylvania system. So it's not the greatest change. Now, we also see at this time, this is not in your text much, but I think it's important, a split between the North and the South. Now, the North and the South in the United States were developing very differently. The North was gradually becoming a more urban um, more city-centered society, and the South was remaining very rural, and of course it had slavery. So in each of these, these two different societies, um, different approaches to incarceration were created. In the South, they didn't like the modern penitentiary model that the Pennsylvania and New York developed. They were really more interested in utilization of the, the prison labor effectively even after the American Civil War as a substitute for slavery. And you know you can, uh, you, we all know that the Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, 13th in particular, will end slavery, uh, but um, a quasi-slavery continues afterwards and the, and the way this is imposed in the South on black populations is through the criminal justice system through arresting blacks, particularly black males, for either very minor crimes or, or something we wouldn't recognize a crime at all, like vagrancy, not having a job, not having employment. And they're really utilizing in the same roles that they were utilized when they were slaves. So after the American Civil War, um, the, the we have another re-examination. And again, because New York is, is really the dominant state in the United States from gosh, probably about the 1860s uh, through the 1960s. Uh, a lot of these take place in New York. So we again, this is a, a New York system or the Elmira system named after the town of Elmira. Now it's developed in 1876 by a man named Zebulon Brockway. And he begins to not treat prisoners as a mass. He says, you know, we've got to look at them individually. One of the things he wants to do is he wants to separate out younger prisoners. This is the beginning of the child safer movement. This is the beginning of uh, a bunch of social movements. They're going to look at juveniles different than adults. They begin to reward good behavior. And this is a trend that's going on across the industrialized world. The English are using something called the mark system, where if you behave, you get good marks and you can earn your way out of prison. So we're allowing parole under supervision. Uh, we're trying to reform the prisons in the 1870s with the emergence of the Elmira system. And there is, doesn't need to look like a riot. 
uh, Zebulon Brockway, looking at his, and they would be called prison guards back then, corrections officers today. Replacing that is the rise of the medical model. Now this is a, a little different, and you'll notice that this is based on the idea that crime is caused by external factors, and those factors are things like social, psychological, physical, genetics. Um, that's that's in many ways how disease occurs. You know, why did someone get sick? Well, maybe they were living in a, a neighborhood where, uh, you know, they were so poor that they didn't have access to heat during the winter, or they didn't have access to air conditioner in the summer and overheated. Uh, psychological illnesses, physical illnesses, obviously, and so and or genetic predisposition to illness. So it it began to look at it as as really an illness, and prisons were going to treat people. Now this didn't last that long, because quite quickly, and gaining strength, um, there there were people that opposed this medical model uh, of crime and of treatment, um, and they wanted to emphasize that you know. People don't become criminals because they're pressured into it by society or because they're mentally ill or they have a psychological maladaptation or they have a genetic predisposition. They become criminals because they choose. So the way to deal with that is to get them to choose something else. Where does this come from? Well, like I said, at around about the 1970s, we really have a reaction against the social progressive movements of the 1950s and 60s. This is right around the time that uh, we see just at the end of this we see some major social and legal decisions example would be Roe v. Wade um, but in 1974 Robert Martinson writes I would say probably one of the most important articles uh, ever written in the uh, field of penology which is the study of prisons and it was called What Works and he basically it's, it's basically a venting of frustration um, it didn't seem that anything worked that we were trying. These medical models weren't working. The, the isolate, so the nothing works doctrine, believe it was born. And, and the idea was, okay, we're going to go back to spare the rod, spoil the child type thing. We're going to go back to punishment. Uh, now, that's not to say that punishment works. There's not a lot of evidence to show making prisons harsher and harsher lowers your crime rate. In fact, there's a fair number of studies that show the opposite. But we didn't know what else to do, or we thought we didn't know what else to do. And the general public was moving against the idea of coddling prisoners. So in the modern, um, looking at the modern, we, we, we went to somewhat of a custodial model, where you incapacitate, you deter, you punish. That's the dominant model. We tried in the 50s, in through the 70s to really rehabilitate. This is the medical approach. I guess today you could say we're, and then punishment reemerges. Uh, but we, today we're trying to reintegrate, prepare the inmate more to rejoin society. It's, it's less fixing them and more preparing them, if you will. So who goes to prison? Let's take a look at it. Um, there's two graphs here. There's the federal on one side, that's on the right side, and the state's on the other. So if you look at the state graph, you'll notice that violent criminals constitute a little over 53%. And um, this is a pretty accurate, uh, there's been a few small changes. Um, th these, uh, this is 2014. I looked at the 2019 because, again, the COVID epidemic has screwed everybody up. That hasn't changed a lot. Um, the, the number of violent criminals in the state has gone up to 53, and the property has gone down, and the drugs has gone down slightly. But it's a, that's a pretty good snapshot. You'll notice that most, about half, are violent offenders. But there's a very significant that are just thieves or drug addicts or have committed a moral crime like prostitution. Now flip it over on the federal side, mainly drugs. And these are primarily going to be drug dealers, but not exclusively. 50% are drugs, 36% are public orders. Only a very small sliver, you'll notice 7% at the federal level are in there for violent crimes. The feds don't incarcerate a lot of violent criminals. They have some, but they don't, involve, they don't incarcerate a lot. All right, um, 
this is a Brookings Institute. Again, this is a breakdown of the prison population. First of all, there's the general population of the United States, and this was the best kind of chart I could find that gave us a real snapshot one to the other. You'll notice that there's 64% of the population is uh, classified as white. 38% uh, of the prison population is white. So it's roughly half what one would expect. The overall population in the United States is about 12% black or African American, and they're about 36% or three times. So you're half as likely to go to jail if you're white and three times as likely to go to jail if you're black, which really means uh, comparing blacks to whites, a, a white, a, a black is six times as likely as a white person to go to jail. That's a pretty shocking statistic. Uh, now, I, I have a disagreement and I've, I don't know if I've talked about this in class, I have a disagreement with having that third category, Hispanic, Latina. Um, I think putting a ethnic group in like that is is somewhat disingenuous, somewhat dishonest, uh, because after all, aren't there black Hispanics? Aren't there white Hispanics? Why are you separating out Hispanics in that group? Uh, are we just getting used to treating them in a, a, a different way? Um, there is, um, you know, there's a wonderful book I read once called When the Irish Weren't White. It was essentially the title, or When the Irish Became White, I forget the actual but essentially it argued that for a long time if you were going to look at charts like this you'd see a block that said Irish and Irish really weren't considered Northern European white Anglo-Saxons, the WASP and if you would have seen this chart say in uh, 1820, 1840 they would have blocked it out based upon ethnic groups you'd still see a block for blacks but you definitely would see one for Irish so I think this is something that we need to discuss and examine, um, but I think if we set that block aside, the 15, 16% of the population is Hispanic and the 22%, it's about the same, so I don't think it's going to interfere with the rest. I do, I do think this shows that, um, you know, when you're six times more likely if you're African American to be in prison if you're white, it, it shows that something has to be going on. Okay, prison organization and management. Let's, let's talk about what we're doing here. Basically, there's kind of a motto, there's a mission. You keep them in, so you don't want them to escape. You keep them safe, uh, you don't want them hurt. You keep them in line, you, know, you don't want them you know, running the place. You keep them healthy, and you keep them busy. So all prison organizations are hierarchies and a hierarchy quite simply is a pyramid very often at the top of the pyramid you're going to have the boss and at the very very bottom of the pyramid you can have all little workers uh, and here you're going to have at the top you're going to have the warden who's often called the superintendent and he is overall responsible and then you're going to have departments under him now it's not always clear what everybody does so if we look at this, this is a typical organizational chart for a warden. Now you'll notice at the very top we got our warden or our superintendent. And then most of you would probably say, okay, well, they're primarily concerned with custody. And you'd be right, you'll notice that there's a deputy warden, and sometimes we give them military ranks like major, captain. Um, and this major or captain, this deputy warden otherwise, would be in charge of the security forces, the guards, the training, safety. They even do prison discipline. They'd investigate what goes on in the prison if there was a stabbing, a shooting, or drugs were found. And they would do, they would handle visiting. But look at these other three blocks. Um, there's a management. Someone's got to run the bureaucracy inside prison. And that is, how do you spend the prison budget? How do you make sure that everybody gets paid? How do you buy what you need? Electricity, water, uniforms. Um, how do you run the food services? How do you run the commissary selling, you know, the small stuff? What about clothing and laundry? What about maintenance? Okay, and besides that, now we've got, uh, you could almost call this the rehabilitation or, or the sort of enrichment warden treatment. Um, you know, if you go to central prison here in Raleigh, uh, I used to take uh, students on tours before COVID quite a bit. You know, one of the things you'd see is there is an actual kind of hospital inside there. And you're going to treat inmates that suffer from mental illnesses, uh, that suffer from physical illnesses. They, you know, one of the things we have in the United States is an explosion of diabetes. Uh, recreational facilities, you know, you're going to keep them busy, um, 
people that have nothing to do can get violent, so let's find something they can do. Maybe it's walk around the prison yard. Maybe it's just something as simple as letting them, uh, you know, watch TV or play basketball or something. Volunteers, religious services. Now, the, the last one there is the deputy warden in charge of industry and agriculture. Uh, most prisoners, uh, depending on whether it's a medium or a maximum, they're not super max, most prisoners will work in some ways. And they might work in uh, essentially a factory inside the prison. Or they might work in an agricultural sense. They may be working on a prison farm. Notoriously in Louisiana, the Angola prison grows a lot of its own food. Um, most of the uniforms worn by the American military are manufactured in American prisons by prisoners. So let's look at um, Central Prison here in Raleigh, and this is one of these things I, I like to add, to try to give you an idea. Um, there's about a thousand inmates in prison, and you're going to have to have 700 full-time employees. Now those are, aren't all corrections officers, or, or what is called in common parlance, guards. Um, but a lot of them are going to be. And don't forget, you're going to have to have multiple shifts. You know, So if people work eight hours a day, you got to have three shifts of guards coming in. Uh, and then you have to have someone that's going to run the infirmary. You're going to have to have someone that runs the commissary, the training, the visitors, the whole nine yards. Now, this is the state's maximum facility. So this is our maximum prison. Uh, the initial central prison um, was built in 1884, ironically, by convict labor. Uh, about the same time, if you come to Raleigh and you look at the governor's mansion, uh, that also was built by convict labor quite a bit. Uh, but in 1980s, the late 1980s, uh, I was practicing at the time, they rebuilt a lot of central prison. There's very little left that you could directly point to and say, oh yeah, you know, here's this room was always here. There's bits and pieces of it, but it was heavily rebuilt in the 1980s. And it's pretty rare in some ways that we have a prison located in our capital city. There are 384 single cells. So obviously, if you've got 1,000 people, you're going to be double bunking some of them. It does hold the death row for both males and females. Um, it's the only place executions take place. And like I said, there's a 144-bed mental health center uh, or period health center. I mean, there is basically a hospital in there. All right, what's the cost? Um, close custody, which is maximum, uh, these are the average numbers that I could find, about 42 to 44,000, and that's 2021, 2022 numbers. As I said, North Carolina's was about 37, it's a little bit cheaper, but I think it's fair to say somewhere around 40,000 for maximum, 37, 35,000 for medium security. Minimum security, you see, this is not that much cheaper, it's still 30,000. And then community supervision, here's where you see that big drop off I talked about before, 1800 to 1500 a year. That's a huge savings. So you have to remember that prisons are expensive. And I think you should keep that in mind anytime a politician says, I want to lock up more people. I'm going to get the streets safe by putting more people in jail. Because the next words out of his mouth should be, then I'm going to have to raise your taxes to pay for this. Because if I have to put a thousand more people in jail, that's forty million dollars, and you know, forty million dollars is a lot of un money and ongoing costs. That doesn't include building the prison itself. All right, so governing prisoners, um, you 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 do want order, okay? There's no single absolute structure that's used, but you do want order. You've got to get the prisoners to behave. And there's two basic ways to get people to behave if you're a utilitarian, which many people, at least by default, are. You give them carrots, you give them sticks. So one of the carrots are very small amenities that you purchase in the commissary. It might be something like a transistor, transistor radio, as it used to be called. Or it might be a Snickers bar. Or it might be a, a Coca-Cola or something. It might be something minor like that. There's also... Um, the sticks, obviously. Now, there's services that, that can be available, like help them get their GED, help them learn a trade or a skill. All these can be pretty valuable for them. All right, so one of the things we can talk about is the different types of prisons. Um, uh, 
typically what we do is we look at how dangerous the criminal is, how serious the crime is, and what's your risk of violent contact. And we're going to give you a classification. Now usually there are up to four different levels and we're going to exclude from this the levels of um, community corrections. Uh, supermax, maximum, medium security, and minimum security. So let's talk about supermax. Now technically North Carolina doesn't have a supermax. Um, supermax would be where we house, house the baddest of the bad, really in a perpetual state of lockdown. So there's a prison out in California called Pelican Bay. And basically, in many ways, it's a throwback to the old Pennsylvania Walnut Street Jail. Complete isolation. You are in your jail cell 23 and a half hours a day. You are only there by yourself. Now, you're not completely isolated. There's a closed circuit TV. Um, you, you, there's a little bit of interaction. But you are on lockdown all the time. Um, you are fed in your jail cell, you get limited time out, usually to walk around a concrete yard, um, so it's, it's not what I would call a happy place. Maximum security prison is, is what I talked about when I was talking about central prison, and this is still going to have dangerous felons, so if you go to central prison in Raleigh, you're going to have people that committed some pretty horrific crimes. There's a lot of focus on security and surveillance because you don't want them out, it's, it, I would say it's a quasi-military structure. There's ranks. There's, there's things people do. Um, inmates' lives are very programmed and orderly. Now, stepping back from this, and these two are actually where the majority of prisoners are. Medium security and then minimum security. Now, medium security, about 45 or almost half of all prisoners are there, less dangerous usually not that violent, um, certainly not someone like a serial killer or a, or a homicidal maniac. Less restrictive, more contacts between inmates. Uh, and here, I think because you, you don't have the tension you have in a maximum security prison, there's more opportunity. There's more educational opportunity, more treatment programs. Finally, at the minimum level, um, these are for very low risk uh, offenders. Nonviolent offenders could wind up here. Uh, you know, in the federal system, if you had a, a minimum security, you know, you had someone that committed bank fraud. You know, you're not going to worry about uh, someone who committed bank fraud stabbing someone. So you're going to put them in a minimum security. There's more rehabilitation. Uh, there's more freedom to move about it. Um, still, there's restrictions. It's, it's not the nicest place in the world, but it's really, you don't have to have armed guards. It's really designed to handle people that are bad, they've, they've obviously committed crimes, but um, this is an alternative, and, and cheaper. Okay, let's talk about the rates of the prison population. In the 1980s, for lots of different reasons, the prison population in the United States began to skyrocket. So we went from less than, uh, if we look at, say, 1985 or so, less than a million people in custody to way more than 2 million people today, 2.3 currently in jail, prisons, juvenile facilities, immigration. About 55,000, strictly speaking, in prisons. We'll stick a pin in that for jails, probation, parole. We've got different numbers. As I said, the total in North Carolina is about 160. Why was there this increase? Well, okay, first and foremost, we took more crimes and made them punishable by time in jail. Things in the past where you would get a fine or a suspended sentence, now you went to jail for. This was that get tough approach we talked about after what works. Our sentences got longer. Uh, this is really the politicians. This is, this is people in office saying, the general public wants me to get hard on criminals so I can get elected. Um, not a lot of evidence it works, but works for me. Um, let's make sentences longer. Um, federal prisons became larger, although clearly not the, the driving force behind a lot of this. We got rid of parole. Uh, and if you're not letting people out early, you're going to have more people in. We started putting a lot more people for immigration violation in prisons federally. And the, we put more women as a percentage in prison than before. So that's the kind of tidal wave we look at. So you'll notice down there in 1925, 
um, you know, we're chugging along. We, we've got about 100,000. Population in the United States is going up by about 1945 or so. It's about 150 million. Uh, but still, you know, it's, it's not increasing. And we've got a, a low, if we look at the U.S. state and federal prison populations, in the 1970s, we're right at around 200,000. Now, by the 80s, of course, we're, we're, we're getting up higher. And by 2017, we're at 1.4 million. And th these numbers are a little different because they're, they're counting them a little different. But it really shows you this kind of tsunami of the growth of the prison population. Um, the Bureau of Justice, if you looked at that, would, would dispute some of those numbers. But they wouldn't dispute the overall trend. Okay, North Carolina has seen a real increase too, and you, you'll notice these are our specific numbers. Um, uh, you'll notice that we have 36,000 in state prison, we've got another uh, 19,000 in our local jails, and we've got another 11,000 in our federal prisons, we've got a few other voluntary commitments, um, and then you've got everybody on probation parole. So there's 67,000 inmates locked up in North Carolina right around now. So we, and if you'll notice our trends there, and those are those lines uh, on the left-hand side, you'll notice that North Carolina sees this big increase too. Um, very dramatic. So why did it grow? Uh, our sentences got longer. Prosecutors filed more charges. Prosecutors found that they would get reelected. Um, we arrested more people for drugs, for weapons, uh, and other crimes getting actual prison time. Legislatures also created your mandatory sentencing. Uh, they, they enacted sentencing enhancement. They ended probation and, pro well, they ended parole, not probation. De-incarceration. I, I had to put that in. Uh, everybody's played Monopoly. Um, not everybody finishes a Monopoly game, but everybody plays it. We all have seen the get out of jail card. Um, De-incarceration is the idea we're kicking you out of jail. And if it's costing me to put 1,000 inmates in, in central prison, at $40,000 an inmate, if it's costing me $40 million a year, um, you know, that's expensive. So how can I cut costs? Well, one of the things is I could get some of those people out. And I could start asking myself the question, do I want to put nonviolent offenders in? No, let's kick them out. Do I want to um, decrease imprisonment just because you have a technical violation of probation parole? No. So many states have adopted these trends, and many states really are seeking to limit the um, how how many people they have as a percentage, because a lot of it's being driven by cost. Let's be honest. Let's talk about some of the negative impacts of these prisons. Um, not something your book talked a lot about, but I think it's fair to mention a couple of these, and we'll talk more about it uh, when we talk about the inmates, but. 2.7 million minors have a parent in prison. Now you have to remember that when you remove one parent from an equation, whether it's the, the father or the mother, you are going to dramatically increase the possibility of problems for the child. Uh, you remove the, the father, let's suppose he's the wage earner, well, now there's a lot of issues like, okay, how are you going to support the child? If you incarcerate the mother, sometimes that's a custodial issue. She might be the wage earner. What happens? Um, there are high, if, if parents are incarcerated, it's linked to high levels of their children uh, contracting sexually transmitted diseases, high levels of early pregnancy. The inmates themselves show high levels of physical and mental health problems. They show high levels of addiction to drugs, unemployment, and homelessness. Now, those might be both, because don't forget, this might be a causative and it might be a correlative. We started our lectures with looking at those two things. It might be being caused by prison or it might be simply part of prison. And again, this is a disproportionate impact on members of minority groups. All right, let's talk a little bit about private prisons. Um, Private prisons were one of those big ideas uh, that came along and people said, you know, government's inefficient. Well, no kidding. So um, let's turn it over to corporations. And, and today there's, there's really two super large corporations that are involved here. There's about two dozen um, 
two of the largest are, are called Core Civic and the CEO or GEO group, I'm sorry. And they manage about 190 facilities. And believe it or not, they have revenue. And all this money has to come from the state of $4.1 billion a year. Now, the thing about this is um, if they're housing, and it, and it works out to about 8 or 9% of the total prison population. Don't forget, we want it to be cheaper. We say, okay, what's it costing you to run these? Well, they say it's, it's costing us hopefully $63 a day. Okay, great. But very often, you know, a private prison doesn't have to make a profit. So it's not, I mean, excuse me, a public prison doesn't have to make a profit. So it's not as simple as all that. Um, it can be more expensive because the you may be saving money on certain labor costs, but you may be losing money on that profit. Now there's less red tape. That's true. Um, they have to follow fewer rules, but this can mean that there are increased levels of violence. Uh, they're very opaque systems. Uh, since they're private, you don't necessarily know what's going on inside. Also, you get what you pay for. If you want your corrections officers not to abuse prisoners uh, or to you know, be engaged in rehabilitation, you pay them a decent wage. Well, the lower the wage, because you're going to save money in a private system, typically the lower the quality of the corrections officer you're going to get. Um, so there's a couple arguments against it. First, um, they seem to be more violent. Uh, second, they are very opaque. We don't know what's going on. And third, you're really treating people as a commodity. You're essentially buying and selling people and their labor in particular for profits. All right, now I started off these lecture, this lecture talking a little bit about uh, prisons and jails, saying they're different. So we're going to shift now. We're going to stop talking about prisons, we'll talk about jails. Jails are the dominant penal institution. And by that, I mean they're going to have perhaps lower numbers on any given day, about 750,000 inmates. But what you got to remember is they've got a high turnover or churn. So if you, if you looked at their total different number of populations over the year, it's going to be bigger. They hold people waiting for trial, and they hold people who've committed very minor crimes, typically misdemeanors. Now, again, we don't spend a lot of money here. And if most people don't go to prisons, they go to jails, let's take a look at our jails. Well, they're overcrowded. If you think our prisons are overcrowded, jails are worse because no one's going to say, well, let's set up a, a GED class for people to go to jail. Why? They're only going to be there 90 days, six months. You know, prison I can see, they'll be in there for years. Let's give them a skill, but no. Um, and counties tend to have fewer resources than states. States tend to have fewer resources than the federal government. So jails are at the very bottom level here. Again, prisons are operated by the states or the federal governments. You are physically separated from the community. You are holding people who are convicted of crimes. You're holding them serving felony sentences, which are often years in length. But Typically, you're going to have rehabilitation and education facilities because you're really thinking about that reintegration we introduced. Jails are different. Jails are operated by a city or county, not by the state. They hold people from the local community in that local area. The other big difference is a fair number of these people haven't been convicted of any crime. They haven't gone to trial yet. Also, you can be there for a very minor offense, often a nonviolent offense. And because there's no idea about rehabilitation, you're only going to have the very, very basics, safety, food, and clothing. All right, so what are jail populations like? First and foremost, they're younger, overwhelmingly young men. Uh, you know, I, I often say, you want to know crime happens, people get drunk, people get stupid, people get hurt. And the people who like to get drunk in society are young males. So jail inmates are more likely to have been convicted of nonviolent crimes than state inmates. You're also going to have pretrial detainees. You're arrested, but you can't post bail. That means you're poor. Now, you are innocent, um, but you're going to be denied your basic freedoms. And of course, you're probably going to lose your job. Um, if you're living in an apartment, you're going to lose the apartment. 
Um, and this again can be used as an incentive, we talked about this before, to get people to plea bargain. And you're going to have people convicted of very minor crimes. Now most crimes in jail are served in months, so you have days. Um, typically 30 to 90 days is a very common sentence. And many inmates will get credit for time they served before their trial. Um, so very minor. The others in jail. Now, jails can hold people who are in custody but not in the formal system. And these can be people with substance abuse problems, mental health problems, and domestic problems. Additionally, um, we're sometimes asking our jails to hold immigration violators, probation and parole violators, and people detained for their own safety. We have in North Carolina a statute that allows the police to take someone in custody for their own safety for limited periods of time. And the place they're going to take you is going to be jail, not prison. Uh, because prison's not going to take you, you've not been convicted of a crime. So who runs these jails? These are run, uh, there are about 3,000, 3,300. Almost all of them are run by a sheriff. And you, if you look at North Carolina, we've got 100 counties, we have 100 sheriffs, we have more than 100, well, uh, because some of the bigger counties have jails and then satellite jails like Wake. So you can have some serious problems with your inmates. As I said, um, mental illness. There's a lot of people in jail that aren't violent, but they've done something that betrays mental illness. You know, you might arrest someone in a public park who's running around naked saying the aliens are coming to get him, you know, or that uh, someone stole his brain. Okay, well, obviously there's mental illness there, but they also committed a crime. Um, there's not going to be a mental health bed available for him. He's going to jail physical health problems. Um, you know, if you go to the Wake County Jail or larger, the Mecklenburg Jail in Charlotte, there's going to be a significant number of people in that jail who are diabetic, which means you're going to have to provide insulin for them. There's going to be substance abuse and dependency problems. Detoxing in jail is no joke. Uh, people can die. Uh, detoxing should not be done in a jail. It should be done in a controlled facility. But sometimes you're going to arrest someone who's coming off of heroin or fentanyl or cocaine or meth, crack, and they could have substance abuse problems. The overcrowding of jails, pushing more people in, just makes the problems worse. Um, in stressful situations of overcrowding, we tend to have more violent and aggressive behavior, and those jails which tend to run into these issues are in heavily populated metropolitan areas, the big cities. Big surprise. Also, uh, not something we talk a lot about, but um, sheriffs can make money. For example, in Louisiana, sheriffs get $24 a day, and believe it or not, they can take half of the wages earned by inmates on outside jobs. In Alabama, they actually get to keep surplus money used to feed the inmates, I mean, keep it themselves. Uh, I was reading one in 2018 one uh, had, uh, it should be took, not two, took uh, over, I'm not sure if this was a yearly or if it was over his whole four-year term, he, he made $750,000. That's significant. By the way, that would kind of build in a very perverse incentive on how you treat them. Um, we may start charging inmates to make money off them. If you go and you try to make a phone call in both prisons and jails, it's not you put in 25 cents or 50 cents you're going to have to make a restricted phone call. It can be $25 plus extra fees and that money is very often split with the warden or the sheriff who use it to you know, fund guards or, or, or fund facilities. Okay, what's the future of JRs? And I, I know I'm going to try to keep this um, fairly short. I'll lose one other thing I want to talk about that's not in the slides. We are building new generations of them. The architecture of jail was secondarily to its purpose. So most jails are linear. Jails are along long corridors. The new jail has more interaction. Um, and there's direct supervision, but it's it's not your old joke, it's not your grandfather's jail. Okay, that's a third generation jail. You can see how it's direct supervision. You've, you've got this kind of quad in the middle. Uh, the jail cells are structured around it. Bars and metal doors are absent. There's less dehumanization. You're trying to make it an easier place to run. Okay, well, that's... Um
Uh, one, one last thing, and it's, it's in your text, uh, and I will talk about it obviously in class. I'm not going to talk about it here because it's really more debate, and that's the right to vote. What do you do with these inmates after they get out? Should they vote? If you don't let them vote, what does that mean? If you're saying they can't vote, should they not be counted for the purposes of proportional representation? Or and, and effectively, are you creating the same sort of three-fifths problem that the U.S. Constitution created? All right. Um, wish I had more time to talk about that. But like I said, I like to keep these right at 50 minutes. Um, whenever you're ready, um, you can go over to Chapter 14. You have a good evening, day, weekend, morning. I will talk to you later.